Uh, so thank you, Amanie, for joining us for this wonderful and um, thankful event. <laughs> Think for it. I don't know if it's a good word, but <laughs> it's a good word. <laughs> uh, it's because in this crazy moment, um, the best thing that I can do is create some reflections and thinking about our dancing and our lives. So this event and talk to you, it's about it. It's about here and it's about understanding and it's about change and it's about life experience and all of this and you are the reflection of all of it <laughs> well thank you cynthia i'm so happy to be here and to take time out with you on this wonderful day to share with some of my experience in this big panorama called dance uh so i have a couple of questions uh, some of them it's from our community from our um, uh, some of our students and some of our Brazilian people and another one it's another couple of questions it's from myself and I saw um, as I told you I saw black dance stories I, I saw your speech on black dance stories and was so beautiful and I take a couple of notes for I ask to you about that too um, and I would like to start at the beginning who is Amania Payne? Whoa! Well, <laughs> <laughs> how much time like you have? I, well, that's true, but let me convince. I would like to think that I am just a plain, simple, wonderful African born in America. However, I was told that there's really nothing much simplistic about me, but I have some wonderful beginnings and continuance inside of the field. I come from a small place in the United States called Baltimore, Maryland, not far from Washington, DC. I lived there most of my childhood and teenage years. However, my artistry was calling. So during that time in about 1972, or really 70 in high school when I got introduced to dance, at that particular time, of course, I was kind of flighty in my mind. And what I mean is that you just really don't know as a teenager what your calling really is, but however, the creator and the spirits guide you. So uh, in the 70s, I started dancing in Baltimore as a teenager, not really knowing that this was a passion at that time. And then I started reaching out into places in my surrounding area. I found more work in Washington, DC, which being a melting pot with a lot of different nationalities and cultures coming together, it was a very good start. At that time, I was working with a group called African Heritage Dancers and Drummers, which set my forte in terms of African dance on the map. It gave me a great foundation. I spent two years in DC, but then there's another calling, which I came to New York at that particular time. And for those who don't know, New York was a place they say, if you can't make it in New York, you can't make it anywhere else in the world. When I say make it, I mean as an artist, because everyone used to come to New York to be able to find their fame. And this is before even thinking about Hollywood and the movies, but the dance world was very important in New York. I lived in New York between 13 and 14 years, where I did a lot of my studying, where I met a lot of people, where I started my international travels. And from there, I worked with various groups, Roots of Brazil, International African American Ballet. At that time, I had numerous teachers. I also did side work with a Congolese group side work with a Trinidadian group, side work with a groups from Jamaica. I traveled and worked with people like Bob Marley, the I Trees, Third World. I had an opportunity to even meet Gilberto Gil when I was in New York in the, in the early 80s, which was absolutely wonderful. There was a story behind that. After the show, everyone was standing in line. 
I did not speak Portuguese. So I said, I'm going to stand in line too, because I saw everybody getting a kiss from Gilberto. And he was so spirited and so good as an artist. I stood in line. And actually, I'm so happy I did, because that's where, even though I work with Roots of Brazil, which was a fabulous dance group directed by Ligia Barreto, that was when I found the Brazilian energy within myself. And he was like, oh my God, you look like a sister. He started speaking Portuguese to me. And I said, oh, no, follow Portuguese. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and which, so. Which, and, year, which year was this? Oh my God. Let me see. 19. It's probably, around. 7980. Because I think that when, when he do that, uh, that song, Isabel and, and Cynthia, I got you, Shango, I la, I la, 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 la. Remember that, everybody? So yes. that was in the early 80s, right? Yes. 70s, 80s? Late 70s. Late 70s. Before they yeah. filmed it, Tenta dos Milagres, Cynthia. Yes, yes. Tenta of Miracles. Exactly. And that movie was being featured. Thank you, Isabel. <laughs> <laughs> I just remember standing in line. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, New York was a great experience because uh, there was so many dynamic teachers. Even uh, at some of the centers we have, uh, Jolom and Lurio Machato, which was like the fabulous uh, capoeiristas that was in Chicago and formulated groups and taught about the culture and the history. And so growing up in all of that energy before I continued my other travels, working later on as directors and etc. cetera, uh, I came through a kind of like revolutionary time where black dance and black consciousness and we as a nation of people, not just in America, but around the world was collaborating and bringing dynamic forces together in the field of the arts. Uh, during that time, I had a chance to be able to meet many of the elders in dance. And I say that because now in Brazil, there's Lindy Hop. So I had the opportunity to actually work with Mama Lou Parks, Norma Miller, Frankie Manning, Al Mims, Sugar Sullivan. I even went on tour with Cat Calloway. And the other dancers and elders within that whole arena and area the Copa Aesthetics tap dancers, you know, they shared their energies and they passed on the traditions in these dances that without even knowing that they had to pass it on. It's a natural phenomenon of us as a people. And I'm quite sure you see that in the Brazilian folklore as well, growing up, your traditions are passed on. So this has never stopped from Africa. Well, later on, um, and doing research, studying, dancing, performing, guiding, this, that, and other touring. Mm. Okay, I had a chance to go on tour with Stevie Wonder. Okay, but well, yeah, I did the same thing. <laughs> Cynthia. What? <laughs> yes. Come on, and, I'm almost dying when you say Cab Calloway, and now you say to me Stevie Wonder. Yes, and I, worked, hey, um, <laughs> and I worked at the Bob Marley Center with uh, the I Trees and Rita Marley. I, I did reggae sun splash and worked uh, with Muta Baruka and uh, Third World, taught classes there. Even in, uh, okay, so let me fast forward. So all that was like in the early 80s and everything. I, I, I toured with a West African touring company. Um, oh my God, we just did so many things in life. And um, I worked with trailblazers and now I feel as though I am a trailblazer myself. So then later on, after leaving New York, I went to Chicago. I'll say about 1987, I, um, well, I had been traveling back and forth, going back and forth to Chicago, because when you learn well, you share. But I always say, because I've had so many dynamic teachers, we had to always humble ourselves, totally. <laughs> so I always tell my students, because it's something that I also believe in, is that whatever it is, our life path and our artistic life is like buckets of water. 
we learn, and every time we learn something, it's like water being into put into the bucket. But I've always been told there's always something else to learn. So when you come to the classes, empty that bucket out so that you can always put something else in it. So I believe that as a part of my a philosophy inside of my dance training and teachings. And I try to instill that inside of the students that I work with also. So now then I moved to Chicago and I actually lived in Chicago for 33 years. Yeah, that was a long time. Um, and most of the places I went to, I really didn't have family. So I made family. So people like, I made extended family, people like Isabel, and my other various friends that I have from various places around the world, they became my family, which are like branches and extensions. So wherever I go, I have a family to go visit in the world. And that's such a blessing. So in Chicago, I, I was uh, asked to become the new artistic director of a fantastic group called Muntu Dance Theater of Chicago. And Muntu interpreted for that company meant the essence of humanity. What is the best inside of our African presentations or of traditional forms and diasporic forms and contemporary forms? What can we show within many of those idioms the best? in our humanness. We all have something to offer. And I think that's one of the downfalls in life today is that we think it's already, we think that we have become the sole creators and now look what I can do, as opposed to understanding that research is important because you will find that whatever it is that you think that you're doing has been done before. So, that's when, in Chicago, I had the opportunity to be able to do a little more research in our African connections in various places. Uh, in the 90s, we went to uh, Ghana, West Africa, and participated in the Panafest, which brought Black nationalities from around the world to participate in this united front of African present artistic presentations, be it through dance, media, storytelling, music, visual arts, political arts. It was an opportunity for the meeting of the miles, minds. So when you said a thankful meeting, yes, this is a thankful meeting that we're having. From there, um, we had an opportunity to study in Mexico, the African presence in Mexico, where uh, we went to the southern part of town where just like how Bahia, there's so many of us that's there in the southern area called Veracruz in Mexico. That's where the African presence is really there. That helped to be able to transform aspects of choreographic notions, because when you're dealing with various cultures, you want to try to be able to tell the story and project the history without bastardizing its form. So, you know, a bastard is like mm -hmm. a child that is born out of wedlock, so they don't mm -hmm. really have its mm -hmm. total connections. So the bastardization of our culture has taken place, especially within the Europe, European formats, and they don't always get it right. So now we have an opportunity to be able to at least try to get it right to the best of our ability. That also then took me, and I say me, but my company at that time, that I was affiliated with, we had an opportunity to find funding uh, because in Chicago, they had at that point in the early 2000s, sister groups from other places. Ghana was a sister group and Brazil was a sister group. 
So you were able to find funding for projects that you wanted to do. So we had another project, the African presence in Brazil. Brazil being the second largest place where most Africans are, of course we had to come there. And that started a whole new aspect in my life. Being in Brazil gave me the opportunity to first and foremost, fall in love with myself. So we came to Brazil several times. The first time I came to Brazil with uh, the artistic staff, just to be able to sort out uh, avenues of uh, where to start in making connections. And I had a very dear friend that came uh, who had been coming back and forth to Brazil at first to uh, connect me with the cultural community and the artistic community. But I found out that if you're an artist, especially in Bahia, you're gonna get connected. And that was what was so lovely about this. So we connected with the national company there, with the School of Dance there, with Ola Doom, with Molly Debaye, with uh, Ilya Aye. Uh, and in making those connections, it was like, yeah, this is the beginning of new things. My sister uh, from Brazil, Isabel Harris, we then decided she was going home and I decided to come and take a trip with her also to continue uh, the studies because the company members were coming later on. So I decided to go earlier with Brazil and we made some more communications and contacts. And uh, when the company came, we had an opportunity to uh, do some video footage in a workshop on, uh, with Ilya Ye. We had the opportunity to do the drum festival with Ola Doom. Uh, Ola Doom? Yes, yes. Uh, and then of course, Isabel traveled me around to some of the different places and met so many dynamic artists within the city. Um, one of my favorite artists there that helped a lot in the dance aspect from Brazil was a dear friend of mine named Rosangela Silvestre. And Rosangela actually created a technique that is uh, quite phenomenal. Uh, it's, to me, very uh, sacred to a degree in terms of her presentation of dances and how she connects it with a spiritual aura dealing with ancestral and Orisha entities inside of it, along with the contemporary flares, because she is a dynamic dancer. So she would teach contemporary along with traditional and then inside of all of that. So I had a chance to come and spend time with her. And now I'm very sad because I haven't been there in a long time and it's time to go back home. I feel as though it's a home place. So I'm working on that and hopefully I'll get a chance to come to um, Rio this time because I've only had a chance to come to Bahia, Salvador. So in spending those years, so the years that I spent in Brazil was like 2005, six, seven, eight. So now you know it's time for me to come back to be able to share another experience there. I've met so many wonderful people. Uh, Sister Goya that uh, does the beautiful fabrics and works. Uh, Isabel took me to some of the, we met was Virginia, the singer, Virginia Rodriguez. Yes, I met her. And what was the artist's name that did the work for uh, Ilya Ye at times? Uh, okay, Jota Cunha. Yes. And these are just time now. And of course, you know, you're in Rio and I was down south in Bahia. So I'm quite sure there are many names that it's all right, though. Because <laughs> and so um, continuing on, I. Don't forget yeah. Ben Harper in Bahia. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I almost forgot. Thank you, Isabel. So when we were in uh, Bahia, the artist Ben Harper, and he's a contemporary musician, awesome music. I ran across one of my friends that was playing with him. And I happened to, we were at Ilya Yay, Isabel, sitting because mm -hmm. they was having some type of uh, reception for, I think, the drum festival. And my friend said, who's that sitting there? Amani. I said, oh my God, I'm in Brazil. People are calling my name. 
<laughs> but that's wonderful because I saw my cousins, I saw my family. I was calling people names too, and it wasn't them. But this time it was me. So the percussionist that played with Ben Harper invited myself and the company and friends to be able to get on a bus and come to the venue and perform. And it was 50,000 people at that performance. Ooh, but it's, it's on the streets? It was, where was it, Isabel? It was. No, 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 no. Parque de Exposições. It's like mm -hmm. Rock in Rio. Uh huh. The Festival de Verão da Bahia. Ah, I think I saw a video. Yeah. Uh -huh. That's very important in Bahia, in Salvador. So, um, and, and the work goes on. I, and, and now, I mean, after 33 years in Chicago, uh, unfortunately, my mother had become ill. So I came back home to Baltimore to aid in her health. And unfortunately, she passed away. But I decided to do a full circle and continue uh, to stay here. And now I'm finding new opportunities and new avenues to still share my experiences, to still teach. I'm working with uh, the young lady, Brie, who has a group called Guardian Baltimore, and they do contemporary or social dances of many forms, but mainly focus on Lindy Hop. And so now this gives me an opportunity to bring some of my Lindy experience and some of my um, academic and administrative experience to her organization to help it grow. And with that, it helps me to grow too, because we all continue to grow regardless of how much it is that you think you know, you still grow. And I've just had the opportunity to be selected to teach at the Alvin Ailey uh, camp this summer. And so now we can ask some of the questions <laughs> There's a little idea of who I am, where I come from, and how I'm doing. Oh, it's so beautiful, history. I'm no youngster. I am <laughs> uh, a senior citizen in the field, still able to kick that leg, <laughs> move those arms, and work that body. Do you? Did you talk about? Um... Oh, where's the name of the... Oh, Uncle Willie. Today, many things have changed because when our art forms become globalized, it becomes codified and new definitions for the same old thing happens. And I guess that's growth. It's nothing wrong with it. But it's like when I was growing up, you know, we learned something different and my mom or grandmother might say, oh, that's not that we used to do that. And it was called so and so. So uh, the guys was doing the feet and these are the new dancers like this, in and out, moving side to side. And so he was explaining it to the children. And so of course you have to respect your teachers. You can't just blow that. That wasn't that. So I waited till he was finished. He says, and now we're gonna do the TikTok. And he started doing the TikTok. Now I'm gonna get up and see if I can do this. Can you see my feet now? <laughs> Go a little bit further back. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So TikTok. He said, "This is the TikTok," and I'm watching. And, you know, Michael Jackson used to do, 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 do. James Brown slid all the way across the floor. We did um, do Uncle Willie. Do the Uncle Willie now. Uh, uh, do the Uncle Willie. Okay, all right. So, anyway. <laughs> so, I said to the young man, I said, oh, that's so funny. I said, you know, I said, today is called TikTok. I said, we used to call it Uncle Willie. He said, who was Uncle Willie? I said, well, who the hell know who Uncle Willie is? You got Uncle Ben. <laughs> <laughs> he on the rice box. Uncle Willie, Willie, he probably got lynched because you got the Willie lynch. So Uncle Willie ain't no telling who he is. Mm -hmm. See, there was a law here called the Willie Lynch law. Taught the, uh, the capture, the, the slave masters how to be able to control people. Slide and maneuver. So I'm just, you know, you have to think about paraphrasing different things. You know, who's Uncle Willie? Who's okay. Uncle Bill? So as I said, we came from a very political time. 
And uh, we can always find analysis uh, through political aspects and through our artistic aspects. Sometimes they say, well, this is art, this isn't politics. But if you're a real artist for the cause, you're inside of the politics. Music was our message. We had cold music from a long time ago, all the way from the plantations, you know, all the way through the spiritual music and jazz, all the way through the spirituals. Music was our message, just, okay? But nowadays, because everything has become one world, oh, can't get that message like that anymore. Very interesting. With that, we artists become catalysts to be able to make people conscious or to reveal a message or give an energy and a spirit entity that deals with a sense of awakening. I'd like to hear from you about your relationship with Norma, how, how you know her, because Norma will be in Brazil in 41 and then in 2011 and she had here in Rio. And, but I, I want to, to listen from you, how does relation begin? It's like, oh, you cross the street and then, oh, hi. Well, almost in a sense, <laughs> because it's a sense of family that's within. And if you have that, uh, and I call it that sense of Africanness that's within, that allows you to be able to communicate and find those that you need to connect with. So my experience in Brazil was a very connecting one. I made relations with individuals, with organizations, and with spirited people, and with many artists. Um, as I said before, when we talk, it made me, from where I was at at that time in my life, fall in love with myself again. The natural aura of the place, the natural liberty of the people. Here in the States, the um, condomble kind of experience or the spiritual experience uh, is hidden. It was so good to see it as a part of life. It wasn't something that was, even though I'm quite sure it has it inside of politics now, you know, it's not something that is as familiar, but with many people are connected with their Africanness, that's important to us. It gave me the opportunity to be in nature and hear the beauty of, and the rhythm of the language and to take classes with extraordinary people and then also to share my dance experience with these extraordinary people. So being in Brazil became within myself a sense of oneness that took place. It was a connecting element. It was as if something that had been missing and I had connected to it. You know, even though I'm born here in America, it became a connecting factor to who I am and within my path that I decided to take. So Norma Miller, <laughs> I worked with my, let me go back. I worked with my, uh, 1980, 1981. I worked with Mama Lou Parks, 1980. Introduced her in 1979, I worked with her in 1980. Then worked with Norma and Frankie and Al Mims and that group, the Norma Miller Jazz Dancers, starting 81 up to 84. 45, 84, 45, something like that. So, um, wow, Norma kind of came to me. You know, I, I, I'm a strong believer that if you are on your right path and you might be clueless, God will step in and direct you and put you right where you need to be. That was kind of like how I connected with Norma. I was working with Mama Parks. I had won the Harvest Moon Ball in 1981. Uh, at that point, Norma and Frankie and them were just coming back into vivacious energy. 
to be able to start performing and getting a group together. With Norma, you had to come ready to work with her. You, you, she would not spoon feed you. You had to come ready as an artist and whatever you didn't have, it would develop in being involved in engagement. She was a whippersnapper. She was one of a kind, I'm gonna tell you. You know, uh, she would read you. When I say read you, I mean correct you. <laughs> Not read you, yeah. She would read you like a book, but I mean, she would correct you. <sighs> Worse than mama. <laughs> Worse than mama, yes. So she was my dance mama. Okay, so you wanted to be as correct as you could be so that she wouldn't tell you how she felt about what you was doing. Because it was like, she would, she had a potty mouth uh, that wasn't, you know, you know, potty mouth. <laughs> and uh, woo, but you loved her because there was nobody like Norma Miller. She was the type of person you dare not say, oh, I'm tired. If you said I was tired, what, she looked at you like, I don't have any time. Norma, Mama Norma, which I call her, and I call a lot of my dance mommies and elders mama, Mama Norma, whew, she gave you life. Whenever you thought you was burnt out or tired, she was like, I'm writing a book. I'm going to do a children's book. I'm going to, I'm going to have my lights up at the Apollo at Harlem. I'm, I did this. I got a film I'm going to do. So it was always something next. And so, you know, there is a term that we use here in our African dance genre. It says, have you sat at the feet of your elders? Have you washed your hands as you sat at the feet of your elders? See, it's a continuum of culture. Apply differently, but a continuum. Norma, she was one of a kind. So my relationship with her, like several of us sisters, her, her Black dancers, you know, because it's a difference, was more like, mama daughter, even though she was our dance mommy, she didn't just look for us to teach a step or this, that, and she came to us. We was her extended family. Norma didn't have children that she birthed. So we were her children. Mickey Davison, Darlene Giss, Shirley Duncan, myself, um, wait a minute, uh, da, 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 Debbie, Debbie Austin. Uh, all of us were like her daughters. And then there was Clyde Wilder. He was my partner. There was Stoney. I forget Stoney's last name. Then there was Chaz. That was um, Frankie's son, Chaz Young. And uh, I'm telling you, those days, I'm going to send you uh, a footage that we did from the Red Parrot Club. This was... Um, like Miles Davis came that day. Avery Brooks was there. Um, and the next time we did this show, we did it with um, one of the Nicholas brothers. Yeah. And so, but you'll be able to see the hotness of the dance. You'll see Norma dance too. It's not a real good footage, but it's good enough for you to be able to. I don't know. I really didn't have a lot of the footage until now. They kind of hid it from us. And so there was that old story within the new, uh, the present Lindy Hoppers, the global Lindy Hoppers, let me say it like that, where they had mentioned, because Miss Brie did it in an interview, she said, well, the 80s, we learned that it was the dark age of Lindy Hop. And I said, who told you that? <laughs> and I said, oh my God. So that meant that we didn't, we were null and void. How do people think that Norma and Frankie had their presentations out there? Started being well known more. I mean, they were well known because they were legends, but they hadn't been back in the field until the early 80s. So it was 
<coughs> excuse me, a group of us that worked at the Sandra Cameron Dance Studio with Mr. Larry Schultz. Uh, he was the one who had Al Mims up there teaching. <coughs> and excuse me. And so uh, that's why I asked Brie well, the dark ages for us, for the black dancers, it was our golden age. It was history being passed down. It was working with the great. It was like touching the untouchables. It was being fed spirit and knowledge and humanity all at once. You know, so I don't know, I, I guess the new so-called keepers of the culture, which I question that. Maybe that's what they think. But then there's another side of it. And I continue to ask our dancers to research and find it. You guys found us. I'm not having a neon sign on my back. I'm this, I'm that. We did it. We loved it. We lived it. We learned it. I am thoroughly engulfed in, appreciate, in appreciation for my elders. And I had an opportunity not to just sit at their feet, but to touch their feet, to offer them shelter, to offer them comfort, to offer them love. That's more than what learning a new dance step can ever bring to you. And that's why I said we live that passion. We live the arts. We shared it. We extended it. We a many a breakthroughs and we exposed it to now it yes being gravitated to a global which is absolutely wonderful because it is a dance that touched the world and our black arts from all over has been the healing phenomenon of the world the drums the capoeira the spiritual songs the spiritual sanctness come on now yeah. Is that dark or does that bring light to people? You know, so uh, in the 80s, I also had a chance while I was working with Norm, I had to take a little break because I went on tour, as I said, with Cap Calloway, which gave me the opportunity to, I had worked with um, Sugar Sullivan. She was a mentor of mine when I was with Mama Lou Parks. But um, working with Cap Calvary, these were all dreams come true. <laughs> you know, who would ever think? Mr. Hardy, 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 Hardy. Okay, but have you ever seen him dance? Mr. Cap Calloway was a dancer, artist, musician. Most musicians were dancers. And if they wasn't dancers, they married dancers. When you think about Dizzy Gillespie, the trumpet player, he married the chorus line girl. He could do the shin sham. Look up, uh, it's a footage called Latin Music. It was a PBS special. And Dizzy Gillespie is speaking as he went into uh, dealing with Tito Puente and many of the other jazz greats in Latin music. And he talked about being hooked up with the chorus line dances. And one of the major things that he did in explaining timing and fluidity, he did the gym shame to be able to demonstrate it. And so nowadays it's this whole, well, is it tap shim sham? Is it this shim sham? Is it that shim sham? We didn't do it like that. We all was doing it together. So you just did the shim sham. You know, so life as we continue to evolve, because it is about evolving in life, there's nothing wrong with tradition is tradition, you learn from it, but you also have to respect, respect traditions. And that's why I say uh, within my works, I was trying to find new parameters as I choreograph that would not bastardize. Back to, that, back to that word, the culture. It would not take it out of its context to make it far. Uh, so it put me in communication with the legends being with Norma. Um, and as I said, it, I learned well in the beginning because when you come amongst people like Norma, 
she was a choreographer. She was a producer. She was a storyteller. She, she could teach, but she put them shows together. You know, and so when you're putting shows together, that's not necessarily the time to you have to catch you have to be ready to catch on with war, just like that. So I give thanks that I was able to do that and I learned well. When I show you that when you see that video footage from Red Parrot, you'll we'll see. We were live. <laughs> <laughs> and how long during this period of you? I worked with Nolan for about four years, three to four years. And that's when Mickey came in to take my place with my partner because I started touring other tours. Okay, let me go back and explain that. So, you know, during that time, Norman then wasn't paying a lot of money uh, to perform. And so we as artists that was um, surviving as artists, we had to work. And so um, during that young, vibrant time in my life, I was asked to tour. So I did the Cap Calloway one first, then I went on tour with the West African Touring Company. Uh, then I came back, did some more work with the company, did some more this, that. And then I got asked to um, come to Chicago as an artistic director. And so when I had to leave in those intervals of, um, uh, touring, you know, even when I toured with Stevie, that was during the time also. So I did like six months, three months, this month, that month, that time. And so that way you have to find fillers to be able, because the show goes on. <laughs> you know, the show don't stop because you have other work. The show goes on. But that's when my sister in dance, Mickey Davidson, who you know very well, she came in and she then uh, took up my position with my partner, with our partner, because I had to share him at that point, <laughs> Clyde Wilder, and the show went on. And the show continued on. And until this day, Mickey and I are like, again, sisters in dance. And we are uh, trying to still deal with the foundation from which we were taught and how we too expanded inside of what we learned. I say that because during my time with Norma, I was still working with African dance. So I put together something in 1986, oof, 1986, something called African Swing. Now I I'm know, born in 86. <laughs> Well, now you see. And so trying to remember all of this is like, wee, okay. So we become the computers without all that technology, okay. Um, so in 86, I put together something called African Swing that showed the parallelisms inside of a lot of the West African dance movement in conjunction with the Lindy movements. So in this choreography, I had African drummers, in a jazz band that took place. It was, let me see, five people. Okay. Uh, and so it was, and a singer. And so uh, even uh, dealing with uh, words and the song, we used the song, it don't mean a swing. It don't mean a thing if it don't, ain't got that swing, you know that song, but it went like this. <clears throat> let me see with my bad voice. It don't mean a thing. If it ain't got that African swing, y'all, do what you want, call it what you want, do what you want, call it what you want. I said, it don't mean a thing. If it ain't got that African swing, do what you want, call it what you want, do what you want, call it what you want. There's rhythms of Africa, dances of Africa from the East and from the West. If you and, and so forth and so on. Okay, so. Yeah, and then the drums came in, and then the uh, masquerade came in that dealt with the ancestral spirit, because when the drum calls, the soul responds. And one of the things I tell my Lindy dancers today is that when the drum beat changes, the dance changes. And so you will see that in the evolution of swing dance, how hand dance became prevalent, 
It was in the music how bop became prevalent. All of these are extensions of swing. And these dances still exist. Um, and so from there, I know now that they have opened up within the global community, our brothers and sisters from Africa that are learning swing. And it's just a beautiful, wonderful, and powerful continuum that's taking place. Uh, Norma was no joke. She was very different, different from Frankie, different from Sugar. She was very rebelistic. Oh, she was very impatient, but that was for a reason. She knew what she wanted, you know? She was very astute, even though she might not have finished school. She was one of the smartest people that I ever known. And there was always something to learn from her. So people of that era, uh, those elders, and just to let everybody know, Norma lived for 99 and a half years. You mentioned, you're talking about Norma, and you mentioned Frankie, your means, Pepsi. Pepsi, it's not, you mentioned today, but. Well, Pepsi but... was very instrumental. Pepsi to what at a, I took Pepsi Bethel's classes and I watched his company. I did not perform with him. <laughs> Ooh, he was incredible uh, because he came up with the, a newer version that was an extension of, of the swing. The Pepsi had a style, Pepsi had a way. Pepsi did a lot of floor stuff. You know, his routines was incredible. You learned his warm-ups. That was a dance itself, you know. But he was very powerful. He taught mainly at the Clark Center. That's uh, very, uh, as a matter of fact, today they have something you can look up that's called Remembering Clark Center. And they may have all the different dances and some footage on Pepsi's work, if I'm not mistaken. Pepsi worked there. Uh, as I mentioned, Lori Mill Machado and Jalon, they worked there. Uh, that was a melting pot studio with all forms of dance. So Pepsi touched a lot of people uh, in that field of dance. I'm honored to have taken classes with him. It helped me to formulate the way I do my warm-ups, utilizing, not stealing, just utilizing and extracting some of his knowledge uh, that I could implement within my teachings. And that's what it's about. It's about sharing. Yeah, it's always about sharing. Um, so for you, it was, uh, you work with Pepsi, Frankie, Norma, Cab Calloway. For me, it's like, ah, I love Cab Calloway. Uh, what for you, what for you uh, was all those experience? You work with all those greatest and wonderful artists well i just feel like i have been blessed by the best and what can i say <laughs> i feel i feel like i've been blessed by the best and i feel like i have been blessed to be able to be a part of that you know not everybody have these opportunities so i tell my students, you have to prepare yourself. You never know when opportunity will knock. And we as artists, yes, you learn and you learn well, but you also have to learn vastly too. You know, your body is your instrument. With that, I can do several things. Yes, I have a forte, but I do several things well. And so within that, with the instrument that I'm using, my body, I learn how to adapt those things that I do. And then I expound upon them in my teachings and in my works. Norma will be with me forever. Frankie, Chaz, all of these guys, and Sugar. By the way, Sugar and Chaz are still alive. God bless them. But to all of my ancestors that I've called, I say Ibaye, may their spirits rest in peace, you know, and may their works continue. And now that uh, Frankie have opened up the door for the globalization, which is where you guys come in and the other people from around the world, as well as younger dancers, younger black dancers here from the States. And I give thanks for that globalization because it opened up a whole new world. 
it still deals with continuum. But now that our elders have passed, you know, one of the things they taught us is that within art, it's all right. You just have to learn the avenues of it and how to implement the work. Today, we get so caught up on who's right, who's wrong, what it was, what it is, who did it, who didn't do it. Half the time, the people don't know themselves. They heard a tale. So I give thanks that I've been able to live it, which brought me to the opportunity to love it. That helps me to project it and then share it. You're so silly. <laughs> <laughs> I love your t-shirt. Is that one from your? Is that from? Ah, is that from you? Is that from Brazil? You, you, you formulated that? Well, I have to figure out how to purchase one from you. Okay. I will plan it. I will plan it. Okay. That, I love <laughs> that. That's beautiful. Um, I'd like to tell your community there that um, there are so many beautiful dances in Brazil that I've had the opportunity to learn some. Of course, always view it. It's a type of culture and tradition that has been evolving for years, but yet still ancient and authentic in form. That's what I love. I love those dances, Black dances of the diaspora. You I want have to... a question about okay. this diaspora. Okay. Uh, it's about styles, styles of music that you dance and okay. that you study. Um, if you see some similarities between them and which, one, which ones of these similarities? Oh, that's a long, hard question. Um, yes, I see similarities. Um, Isabel, help me with that. Some of that music that we listen to from Brazil, um, like the samba music, you have the fast samba and the slow samba. Um, I, 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 I do a lot of similarities with the drum rhythms. Okay. Uh, and then I look at uh, Brazilian forms, Caribbean forms, I'm going to say Caribbean forms. Uh, and how those rhythms uh, correlate or can be ingested inside of the dance styles. I look at some of the contemporary music, like for instance, um, what's the guy's name? Will I Am? He used to be with the Black Eyed Peas. Mm. You know Will I Am? Isabel, you know Will I Am? Yes, yes. Will I am. Yeah. Okay, Will I am have a dynamic piece that's called Bang Bang. Sounds like the Charleston when it first opens up. And so uh, when you hear music that has the similarity, for me, it helps me to create. It gives it gives me vision. It gives me ideas. It gives me an opportunity to formulate, okay? Now, how I use it, that varies. Can I use it to work with or to study with or to learn from? That varies, you know? That depends on each artist and how you work. I say, find the varieties, find the similarities, find, especially within the culture of Brazil, you know, there's oh so much jazz music there, there's oh, classical music, classical with jazz. No, it's, 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 you, you, uh, Brazil has such a vast repertoire of music, dance, just art itself that can be explored and expounded in so many ways, but it depends on your vision. It depends on how your heart is speaking to your soul, you know, as an artist and how you create from there. Um, within Brazil and Africa and many other places, I might not speak the language or know the language, but the music and the dance becomes the language for me. And to get more clarity, 
I find people like yourself and Isabel and others that give me knowledge and help my ear to understand what's being said so I can implement better artistically. Again, uh, when, I, <clears throat> when I hear you talking with for Black Dance Stories, you're talking about your sense of responsibility mm. and to preserve and honor legacies of great expressions to dance. Yes. Do you have some tips for us for we keeping this preservation and for we keeping this knowledge and this legacy? Ooh. Well, tips. Stay alert, <laughs> stay informed, study, cherish. Cherish what you have already learned first, okay? Because when you learn something new, a lot of times people have a tendency to throw the old out the window. Don't throw the old out the window. They're like our elders. Your old knowledge is like the elders. You don't want to throw that knowledge away. You want to incorporate it with the new. So the number one, you can stay updated, but also you can be well informed. Study, study, study. Everybody has a version of everything. Everybody's version is correct to them. It's important for you, and I say you because I speak to me too as well, is to dig in and find out for yourself. Share your experiences with your compadres, your friends, your dance extensions, and then collect it, document, and archive, especially your work. A lot of things in the past have gotten lost. Like I didn't have a lot of my works. I'm just starting to obtain them because they're out there everywhere, you know? And in these times, especially those that are creating, copyright your work. If it's music, copyright it. There are pirates. I'm not talking about the ones just in the water, but there are pirates in the industry of the arts. They are those who will captivate your ideas, your essence. They might not do it like you, but they'll captivate it, they'll claim it, and they will capitalize off of it. So a lot of times we feel as though we have to be validated to be able to do what we do. Get validated from God first. Young ladies, and they were so concerned with being validated by others because they felt as though they wasn't good enough and they hadn't been validated. I told them, stop. That's the kind of stuff that will make you stop doing what you do. So get the validation from the creator first, which puts it in your heart, and then spread your wings. So that's what I mean, but we don't need others to validate you. Do your thing, do your thing, but know it. If you're gonna mix stuff, understand the formulas. It's like being a cook. You see, a, okay, for instance, Isabel made a shrimp, a camarón moqueca for me. It was mm, delicious. She leaves my house, go back to Chicago. I said, shut. I had all the ingredients. I'm going to make this moqueca. <laughs> but of course, mine was different because I had. I like to put something else. I threw some crabs in there and then I put some other seasoning in there. But it was still, it wasn't the same traditional dish, but it was so similar and so good that you would have thought it was it. So me, and that's that's how we African Americans are. We are people that even though we built, help build this America. We are still homeless. You, Isabel, my African friends, my crew, they have homes, they have places to go to to call their own. So we are the potpourri of a lot of stuff. You know potpourri? Potpourri, potpourri. Potpourri. We, we African, I like the potpourri. So diaspora, many people take one slice. Brazil, do the Brazilian dance. 
Not all artists, but some of them just do the Brazil. The Africans just do the African. The this only do that because it's of their culture. We here in America, we got African-American culture, but we like to embrace the whole pie, which makes me learn about Brazil. It makes me learn about Africa. It makes me learn about Black people in England. It makes me learn about the Aborigines. It makes me learn about us as a people. And through that learning, I learn it through movement. I learn it through dance. I learn it through song. I learn it through tradition. I learn it through cooking. So all of those things, like to me, dance is life. And when you embrace other cultural dancing, you have to learn about the life that coexists with that. That's why a lot of people that study Lindsay, they got to understand African-American culture too. I don't care who is trying to redo the history. They have to understand that life here. They have to understand jazz music and the mentality of the musician. You see, because all of that is entwined into one. We all have a gift to share. That's why I say learn well so that you can be the extended branch too. I said, like Mickey and ourselves in the 80s, that's when that whole phrase was coined, Black dance. A lot of people didn't understand that. They took it like, I'm... I'm more than just a black dancer, I'm a dancer. But it wasn't that, it was a springboard that was created that helped us to be able to create our own, design our own, name our own, produce our own, do our own without the validation of those powers that be because if we needed their validation, we wouldn't exist today. They would change it to something else. Every time we did something well, it got changed to something else. Every time. And I'm not upset. It's just a reality. You know, that's I, and I, I thank you for talking to me. I don't, even though I've been talking since I've been on here, I don't talk a lot about what I do. And, and lately I've been because people have asked me, you know, but, um, Another tip is to stay humble, you know? So if you become very good and you become recognized, trust me, there's someone else right behind you, beside you, above you, that's just as good mm -hmm. and or will be recognized right after you. So whatever you do, somebody else is gonna do it. Maybe even better, but do yours well. Get that name and get that money if you can. Ha, ha, ha.